This special episode is brought to you without commercial interruption by TR Historical. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, drinkware, decor, and more featuring a wide range of interests from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers gift cards and a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping in the U.S. when you use promo code GBERG1863. So go to trhistorical.com, TR Historical, for the love of history. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this anniversary episode, 160th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg episode uh, of Addressing Gettysburg. And today we are sitting right in front of the 145th Pennsylvania Monument on Brook Avenue. Uh, not because we're going to be talking much about them or even really a lot about what happened on Brook Avenue today, uh, but because it's shady. And also, tourists don't seem to know to go on this road, so we figure it'll be pretty quiet as far as people walking around, buses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, so what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about July 2nd, and returning to the show uh, from yesterday's release, uh, a licensed town guide Roseanne Zyko. Hello Roseanne. Hello Matt. Welcome back. Thank you. And uh, also uh, someone you all know and love. He's been uh, leading our get out of the car tours for uh, four years now? I think so. Fourth year. Uh, we're in our fourth year. Yeah. yeah. Time flies. It does. And uh, he you know th- this year seems to be the year of Lewis as far as releases go. They haven't all come out yet but there's a lot of Ask a Guides with Lewis and of course I'm talking about licensed battlefield guide Lewis Trot. Hello Lewis. Hello. Thank you. Hello. You're welcome. All right. So today we're talking about July 2nd. Um, so the end of last night's episode or yesterday's episode um, we set the stage for July 2nd and what is it like in the morning of July 2nd in the armies? Lee is on the attack during this whole battle. What, is there, what, are, what, are, what are his plans early in the morning? Do we know? So his plans are he does want to attack, but he's got to figure out where the Union Army is to attack it to get for, for most advantage for his army. So famously, he's going to send out one of his staff officers to recon the area south of Seminary Ridge. Um, and he's looking for the left flank of the Union Army because he wants to find the flank and roll it up. His objective for the day is going to be Cemetery Hill. So they don't take the hill, famously, the first day. And so that's what he's trying to do. And he's looking for the left flank. Um, the Union Army is still getting into position. They're not established in what we call the today the fish hook hook, or candy cane however you want to describe it they haven't gotten there yet they're still moving um gary's divisions over on the north side of little round top early in the morning they leave that area they move over to culp's hill um sickles corps has moved in through the night they're told to occupy the position john gary's division formerly occupied sickles is a little confused because he didn't he has a point. They really don't formally occupy a position. They are there in an area, but they're not set up in a battle line per se. So he has, you know, I don't like to give him credit when I don't have to, but I have to be fair. I try to be fair. Um, so the Union Army, all that said, the Union Army is still trying to get into position because they probably assume that Lee's going to attack, although General Meade has offensive plans on his mind also he's thinking about t- attacking north of Culp's Hill that area um, until some of the aides that he sends out there to uh, check out that area why does he tell him that's not a good place to attack and so then things settle in for the Union Army and they bec- it becomes a defensive battle which works perfectly so that's a broad view of what's going on okay Confederates are trying to figure out how the Union Army's configured. The Union Army's actually still getting in place. It's trying to get configured. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Buford's cavalry has moved down. They are in the Peach Orchard a little bit south of that. Right. Because they're obviously no longer where they started the battle. 
Um, so they're in the area for a while until they get sent off down to Westminster to refit and guard some trains down there, wagon trains. So they are in the area for a little while in the morning. Um, there was a soldier in a New York regiment on the north side of Little Round Top Road. It was very foggy. So presumably there was fog in the area. Um, there's intermittent little showers at times, so that sort of you know precipitates the mm-hmm. fog and stuff like that. So it's it's not a crazy hot day to begin with, like we know today. You know, so that's a little bit of what's going on. Okay, uh, Lee uh, famously sends Captain Johnston uh, early in the morning to scout the Union left. Yes, and uh, you know, for those of you who are new to addressing Gettysburg, there's plenty of episodes. Uh, if you go back um, where we talk, of, there's one where we talk about Captain Johnston's ride, and uh, the whole episode is about that. So we're not going to go into too much detail here, but uh, he sends someone, uh, a staff officer. What is his? What is his actual role? Is he an engineer? What's what is? Who's Captain Johnston? He is a. He's a staff officer. I think he yes, he's an engineer, but he's on, just on the staff. So he he takes care of whatever General Lee wants him to do. Right, he's part of the staff. Right. Um, Lee doesn't have a huge staff, so people wear many hats. Yeah, and this is this is the famous episode for this particular staff officer. You don't hear about him anymore. <laughs> right. Um, not that I know of. Um, he also sends his head of artillery, William Pendleton, out to look at things. He doesn't go in the same area, and it's not the area where the Union Army ends up being. So it doesn't get talked about quite as much as Johnson, because Johnson is the one that comes to the south end of the field. And when he returns a couple hours later, at one point, General Lee points on a map and says, did you get there? Right. Pointing He's at talking Little about Top. Little Round Top. And Captain Johnson says, yes, I did. And... Who knows? Nobody will ever know unless no. some obscure letters found in somebody's attic from Captain Johnson to his mom or something. <laughs> um, but he's never been here, presumably. And there's there's different hills over there. Yeah, one hill looks like another hill. Yeah. Um, and he he's he, you know the castle's not there. Yeah, I stood next to the castle. <laughs> it's got a great view if you can get down there. So right, you know, yeah. he's just assuming. Yeah, I I got to that hill. Um. You know, and he he wants to give. I'm not saying he does things on purpose, but he probably wants to give Lee this good report. Yeah, mm-hmm. I got there. Hey, yeah, nobody there. Let's go. Yeah. Um, and so here's the issue: whether he gets to that hill and there's just the four men on it at whatever time in the morning, sometime between four thirty and let's say seven thirty, when the Confederates move south, get into line, and finally attack. That's a day late, you know, that's eight hours later or more. Things have drastically changed. Yeah. That intelligence is so, it's like a dried up, stale loaf of bread. You ain't going to use it unless you're desperate. Right, right. But that's what they go off on, and they never deviate from this. You know, there's, there is never a follow up to the intelligence question. Um, we have what we call RFIs, requests for intelligence. Um, they never send out any RFIs further on in the day. Hey, we need to know what's going on now at noon or 2 o'clock. Right. Things are drastically different. Sure. So. Yeah, a lot changes in a very short amount of time yeah. in, during a battle. Um, all right, so early in the morning, Roseanne, the civilians, they just had an exciting day the day before. Uh, what, are, what are they going through? Well, first of all, I don't think any of them, except maybe for Joseph Broadhead, had a good night's sleep. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, his wife Sarah writes in her diary that uh, he's like, you know, get the impression he's snoring away. Yeah, she doesn't understand how he can be sleeping because she's up all night worrying about things. But and didn't he just like walk back thirty-five miles from Harrisburg or something he like that? Had quite a trip back. Yeah. So um, I don't think it's not thirty-five miles; it's more than that. Well, it was long enough. But, yeah. Uh, so you know, he's he's snoring away, and you know. <laughs> but real quick though. What, what, why was he up in Harrisburg, and why did he have to walk back? Uh, well, he was a railroad employee, and um, you know, many of the men uh, were afraid of being captured. You know, for whatever reason their job might have been. I mean, um, David Beeler was a postmaster. You don't think that is something that 
a Confederate would want to, uh, you know, detain you for, but apparently uh, yeah. postmasters are very important yeah. people. They wanted and their stamps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted those forever stamps. They knew the forever price stamps. was going up. Let's get them while they're cheap. <laughs> Wait, am I mistaken? Was Joseph Broadhead in the uh, 26 uh, emergency volunteers, and did he get captured and paroled? Am I thinking of somebody else? I think you might be thinking of somebody else. I am okay. not up to date on his... Okay. Uh, on his war record. So he, he just basically then, since he worked for the railroad, probably, w- what, just took a train up there to when people were removing their valuables prior uh, to the battle? I, I, I would assume so. Yeah. Don't quote me on it. But that's a long walk regardless. Yeah. So I would be sleeping for several days after that. Um, okay, so what else? So, you know, they wake up in the morning and now the town is occupied. They had a very uh, traumatic day the day before. And now they're not exactly sure what's going to happen. Very tense in town. Um, calm, but at the same time, very, very tense. They are not necessarily confined to their homes by any orders of the Confederate Army, but nonetheless, there are certain restrictions on what they can do and where they can go. And um, a lot of them actually were getting uh, Jubal Early very upset because they weren't being very careful at all with um you know what they were doing I, uh, he he detains uh, charles will who's up on his roof wanting to see what's going on and, mm. and the quote that um uh, early says is he's from you people <laughs> you people are on the streets uh, they're at their garret windows and on the roofs and i send guards from door to door on your streets to tell them to go to their cellars or at least remain in their houses. The only safe place for them. If you people... <laughs> he's really annoyed. Went, but take my advice. I want to save your people. <laughs> yeah. I'm here to destroy the army, but you're, right. you know, you're okay. Yeah, uh, so he's, so he's pr- trying to protect the civilians. He, he, he is trying to protect them. Of course, you know, he comes through on June 26 and strips them of everything they right. need, but you know, but he like want to circumstances kill them. have changed. He right. doesn't want their deaths on his watch. Right. Yeah. You know, so a number of them are, when they feel it's safer, leaving their house. Like, um, you know, Professor Jacobs and his son, they go out in the backyard and realize that's not too safe because there's bullets flying around. So, you know, most of the people um, stayed very close to home and didn't go out looking for danger. It's probably a smart thing to do. Yeah. What Are there, did, did, did the civilians try to resume life as they knew it on the morning of the second? Or they realize, I mean, you got the Confederate Army is in the town, as you pointed out. So, I mean, I guess they can't delude themselves too much, but are there are there some instances that you're aware of, of people, uh, I don't know, thinking maybe that there isn't going to be a continuation of the battle? Or well, some any- people are trying to continue business as usual. I mean, we might have mentioned uh, Charles and John Will, the Globe Inn. Mm-hmm. Um, they certainly had a very booming clientele on July 2nd. And, uh, you know, and then actually they were in a safer part of town, too. We have to remember that when we're talking about the uh, town being occupied by the Confederates, if you're on the southern end of town, you are in most likely a lot more danger than you would be if you're on the northern end of town. Right. A lot of the Confederates would congregate there in the square because they felt it was safer um, you know, from, from the sharpshooting that was going on up on uh, Cemetery Hill. So, you know, it really depended on where you were. I, I think uh, at least for a lot of the women... Um, by this point, many of them have wounded in their houses, and they're very concerned about how are they going to care for these men because, yeah. you know, food, medical supplies, and that type of thing. Are, were, were they expected because the guys were billeted in their house? I don't know if billeted is the correct word for when you're sick and or wounded, but um, because these guys were in their homes, were they told that they're responsible for them, or was this their, if you will, Christian duty? I think that it they was were their Christian about? duty. Although okay. the, you know, the Confederates did tell them, you know, you have to bake. You know, you have yeah. to bake gingerbread. I think is what they wanted. Of course, uh, gingerbread and uh, like, wanted to build some houses, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like Do a little crafts and arts while we're waiting to attack. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was about the gingerbread, but uh, that was mentioned in a couple yeah. of accounts. Uh, like Valentine <laughs> Sophie is a baker, and you know his ovens were going twenty four seven. So I, I, you know, I think you know they were in a position. The Confederates were of um, requiring assistance, and the con- and the citizens are not going to necessarily do too much to um, dispute that. It's funny how uh, you know, just trying to imagine a baker, you know, keeping his ovens going, baking and baking and baking, and there's a battle going on, and there's an like it's just such a weird 
surreal. Well, he's in town, you know, so he's not really going necessarily be affected by any of the, well, the I mean, the stray still, shots that are yeah, going yeah. by. But, you know, some of the women were very upset. They didn't have any yeast, you know. Now I have to make biscuits. It's like, well, so what? <laughs> make a biscuit. <laughs> but, you know, now I have to have my yeast. And I th- it might have been Fanny, Fanny Beeler had one. She had a couple of soldiers that were there helping her out, uh, Union soldiers. And uh, one of them actually left. And I don't know how he found yeast, but he comes back with yeast. He made her very happy to have the yeast. So now she can bake bread. It's so. f- isn't it funny how in traumatic situations... The human mind doesn't always want things that make sense. You know, in other words, like you're in this extenuating situation here. There's a battle going on in your town. You're being compelled to bake bread to feed the invading army. And you are just bummed because you don't have yeast, so you have to make biscuits instead. Like, who the hell cares? I don't know if she had gravy with him either, but... <laughs> you know, well, I, I think that your would mind me. sort of protects... A part of your mind protects the rest of your mind by by getting off track and pinging on something that's mundane. That you can also it's maybe just, control. Yeah, yeah, and that's your mind's way of protecting yourself. I agree. And I'm no psychologist, but I, I, my father was one, and I lived with him for a couple of years. <laughs> so maybe that rubbed up. But that's, I always think it's just the mind protecting itself. It's a defense mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's what it is, absolutely. But it's just funny how we It are. is, yeah. All right, so uh, anything else about t- town early morning before the battle resumes? Uh, well, you know, they, they wake up and, uh, you know, as I said, the ones in the southern part of town uh, quickly realize that they're in harm's way. Yeah. Because you do have a lot of sharpshooting going on between the Confederates and the Union soldiers. Do, do, do they stay? Like, do they go to their cellars in that part of town and stay there? Or do some of them go to maybe the north end of town or maybe out of town? Uh, well, from the sources that I read, um, particularly the, the Garlocks, they said, you know, we stayed in the kitchen yeah. until the fighting started, and then they would go into their cellars. But most of them st- stayed very, very close to home. I mean, there were only a few maybe that went wandering out. Like, I think uh, William McLean's wife was ill, and he needed a doctor. You know, so he leaves the house, and they live on, on uh, in Middle Street, East Middle Street, and he's got to go down a couple of blocks down to Chambersburg. And he's walking among the Confederate soldiers, and he, you know, he was feeling very... Exposed, yeah, uh, yeah. and um, you know his 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 wife or you know his mother actually comes up from her house on Baltimore Street. But I think those were like the only people that were actually walking around mm. their houses any great distance. Okay, so so Lewis then uh, Lee decides his plan. What does he decide? He wants uh, so A. P. Hill's line has already been. Um, extended down Seminary Ridge, and it's in the area of Pitzer's Woods. That's Wilcox, Cadmus Wilcox's brigade is down there, the Alabamians. But he wants Longstreet to move his corps onto the field and further extend that line down Seminary Ridge. And he wants McClaws to put his line perpendicular to the Emmitsburg Road and drive northeast to be joined by more Confederates coming out of the wood line as you go north. And, again, the, the goal is the, the key terrain, and their objective is Cemetery Hill. Mm-hmm. Um, and so th- that's what he wants. And it, there's a famous, um, to show you the disagreement between him and Longstreet, there's a famous episode where Longstreet tells McClaws, no, I want you parallel to the road. And Lee says, no. You know, Lee is micromanaging Longstreet's court at this mm-hmm. point. No, I want you perpendicular and to drive up the road um, to get to uh, Cemetery Hill. So that's the plan. Longstreet is still waiting one brigade to arrive, and that's Evander Law's brigade, the Alabamians, who start their day at a place called New Guilford, Pennsylvania, about 26 miles away. So they get up and walk a marathon, and Lee agrees to let Longstreet wait for this brigade. And so they don't arrive into the area about noon. So it's afternoon before Longstreet even begins his movement to get in place. Um, before Longstreet's corps move, E. Porter Alexander takes the artillery south, and he gets his artillery set up in place. So he has this way of moving west of Seminary Ridge 
without being seen by the Union Army. There's a signal station on a little round top, and that's what Lee wants the infantry to do, move without being seen by the Union forces across the way. Alexander knows the way. For whatever reason, Alexander doesn't lead Longstreet's Corps down there. Right. Um, and Alexander goes ahead of Longstreet's yeah, Corps, Yeah, right? he's, he's ahead of him. Which is weird. Yeah. Right? Because arti- Alexander is uh, an artillery battalion commander. Yep. And he is, was he reserve artillery? He was reserve artillery, yeah. but they move him up because they're confident him to take over the artillery. Right, right. For the corps, basically. But he's moving his battalion ahead of the infantry. Yes. Does he have any escort, infantry or cavalry or anything? No. Um, it's just him. Whether he uses Henry Wentz or not, that's a, another story <laughs> that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he does. I don't think Johnson's involved at all. I know at one point McClaws wants to know if Johnson can lead his his corps down there because Johnson has already been through the area. He reconnoitered it earlier in the day, but they said they tell him no. Um, so this all leads to delays. And Lee says this is another after war or after battle. Certainly, definitely after war. Also, episode that. There's this mysterious Lee wants a, a you know, a daylight, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Dawn. Dawn attack. Well, he wants, he doesn't even have the information back at dawn. He's sending Johnson out around 4, 430, and it's getting light, so that's dawn. Yeah. Um, and it takes a while to get in line. Yeah, and it takes him a couple hours to get back and give Lee the information. Right. So that was totally fabricated, but he does want this attack to go off as soon as as possible as soon as they get in place and it just takes literally all day right at one point longstreet's core that the elite element i think it's kershaw comes up onto a high piece of land little hill and the lead element looks over and they can see the signal station so if they see the signal station they can be seen and so they do a backtrack off that then they do this long counter march instead of just turning around letting the tail become the head they yeah. get too many times this is the confederate's problem and i do think they can win here what keeps them from winning too many times at critical situations they act like petulant children yeah i often wondered the same yeah. thing why didn't they just about face yeah right. no. they're because they're pet no i want to be first it's right. my turn to be yeah, first exactly you they're can't like take children. spot <laughs> tomorrow's I, your turn <laughs> i I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because i always noticed that too and i wondered like is that is that just a cultural thing in the South? Is that like an honor thing? There is or a lot of there is a lot of pride and yeah. honor and ego. Yeah, and it 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 doesn't do you any good when you're fighting a war for your survival. Correct, and it, that's part of the reason they're never going to win because they can't change their personality as a nation. Yeah, they just can't. Well, in the, in the Ken Burns Civil War, um, I forget which episode it is, but uh, it's towards the end, and they're talking about how the Confederacy is falling apart. And they give an example of, uh, I think it was the North Carolina governor had a whole bunch of uniforms, and he didn't want to give it to the National Army because they were only for North Carolina troops. Yeah. And and then, uh, I forget, who who is it that said uh, something that on the... The tombstone of the Confederacy. It should be oh, what, the, what I forget now. The epitaph: um, killed by an idea or something like that. <laughs> yeah, does, does that sound familiar? Yeah. I, I might yeah, be I mangling it here. Like, yeah, but like it seems that they couldn't even at any point in the war really band together, except the beginning, maybe band together enough to win it for it, fear of the confederate government being as strong and despotic as exactly. the federal government they, was perceived to be so their their claim and this is their claim is they're fighting for our rats yeah states rights the war is about slavery no ifs ands or buts that's the right they're trying to preserve mm-hmm. but as the war starts they're still fighting for these individual state rights as the war goes on and the rights change from yeah, we don't want the national government telling us what to do with our slaves. It goes from that to we don't want the Confederate government or some general from another state telling us us what we have to do. Right. And so they never become a whole unit fighting as one. Yeah. Because they never sacrifice on the home front 100%. I mean, that would have been 
a hard thing to do. They still have these big balls down south, you know. Oh, gotcha. And, you know, they're not putting everything into the war effort to get their independence. And then you can go back and have your silly balls and stuff like that. They never fully commit the civilian population. And then when they get on the battlefield, ego takes over, um, pride takes over, and it gets in the way like it does up there behind Seminary Ridge when they say, well, no, I, I'm supposed to be first. Hmm. So let's just, you know, I'll get back to the front of the line, and that eats up time. Time yeah, you don't but, have. But then I'm surprised Longstreet. He's in a foul mood. Yeah, he's in a foul mood. But I'm surprised that foul mood doesn't make him get short with McClaws and be like, no, we don't have time for that. Everybody about face and let's go. For whatever reason, he does. He doesn't. Yeah. Because you know, McClaws is in a foul mood, too. Yeah. You know, they're well, all in foul mood. It's moods. hot. And, you know, it's July. Yeah. But, you know, you mentioned um, the the balls and everything going on back back home. And that's just another example of the acting like children. Like, it almost rem- it reminds me. And by the way, I'm saying this to Lewis, who's a Virginian. And Lewis- Virginia is my home. <laughs> <laughs> my country is Virginia. <laughs> um, the it it, it rem- the Confederacy reminds me of children playing house, getting the chance to actually run the house. Well, they did run the house for many years. The Are you talking the Congress. House of Representatives? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, home. You know, they get to play mommy and daddy, and and they then and as most kids do, they screw it up. You know, and, and it's they just end up like fighting at the end, and they end up fi- yeah, and they end yeah. up fighting with each other, and uh, it's you know, like you would think that if if the war is that important to you. Um, you know, all those balls and everything back home, especially if you're, you know, the uh, strap, the economy is not that good. You don't really have much industry. It's like all you're doing really is running through your savings. It sounds like to me, I mean, I don't know exactly. I'm not big on the economy and all that. And how that well, works, they're, but. their biggest consumers, the North. Right. So they and have so you're so at war much, with them. Yeah. And you, they have so much contempt, you know, the average soldier is the one that has so much contempt for the Northern soldier. Whereas they're just as good, if not better, yeah. than they are. Yeah. And they don't realize it until they're dead on the field somewhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's too late. Now, I, I don't think that about all the the generals and such because they knew each other so much. There's so much of a con- pre-war connection. Right, right. So they, you know, like Lee says when Meade takes over, you know, he might be slow to move, but if you make a mistake, you're not going to get away with the mistake. Right, right. You know? Pennsylvania man. <laughs> He would be cautious, I believe. There's going to be a fort named after him in Maryland one day. (laughs) We must get that fort. (laughs) We must deprive the enemy of a fort. (laughs) I do this a lot at home. (laughs) You sit and practice. I told you I have no time. Take the trash out. (laughs) (laughs) Kids, you yelling at the kids. (laughs) That's great. Uh, all right, so uh, the uh, they get moving. They they have the counter march there, which eats up more time. But finally, they get online. Um, McClaw's division uh, connects with what is it? Who's it? Anderson of Hills Corps? Is that yeah, correct? Yep, yep. Anderson's division of Hills Corps, and then continues down Seminary Ridge. Hood's division falls in line next to him. Yeah, but they're not there yet. Say what now? Hood's division is not there yet. It's when McClaw's gets down there. It's Barksdale's brigade. Gets down there near Millerstown Road, uh-huh. and some of the commanders come out. That's when they see Sickles Corps. Uh-huh. They are not on the left end of the Union line. They've got to move further south. That's right. when Hood's division is going to really move it further south. I see. Okay. Yeah. That's what causes further delay yeah. for Hood's division to move on down there. He's got to kind of angle it in instead yeah, of they're being trying to straight. get on the end. And you know, I don't. I'm not going to talk about Sickles too much because i don't i just don't like to um but there is a law of unintended consequences and not not all of it's bad because sickles moves out that puts his left sickles left even if he doesn't have enough men to defend it in some areas that the confederates have no business attacking right that's a great point so in other words what you're saying is the way for 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 people who don't understand um who they're new to this Explain to them what Sickles does first. So Sickles is a Union commander. He's the third corps commander. Third corps commander. Only 
Corps commander, not military trained. He right. did not go to West Point. He was a politician. Scumbag politician from New he York. He has uh, one division commander, David Burney, is a friend of his. Um, so they're in agreement. Then he has another division commander, Andrew Humphreys, who is military trained, whereas Burney and Sickles are not. So you do have this competent West Pointer with your corps. He's another division. But Sickles probably is not listening to him too much. The area assigned to Sickles, um, if I can put it in a modern context, his right is supposed to be in the area of the Pennsylvania State Monument along Cemetery Ridge where Hancock Avenue is. And then his left is supposed to occupy Little Round Top where the four-man signal station is at and was previously at. Now... If you come off Little Round Top and you're moving north, to the left is Plum Run, and it's very marshy out there. There are intermittent rain showers during the three days. Mm. So that area, just and we know it because of today, not this day, but modern area, you go out there after a rain, even the next day, it's just marshy out yeah, there. Yeah. You sink and your feet get all wet. So, mm-hmm. And then there's a tree line in that area. So... I say all that to say that is not a, a spot where you can put any artillery. If you're going to put artillery facing the enemy, you've got to move further west of that and get out behind those trees and that marshy area because your guns are going to get stuck and you can't see what you're shooting at. So he has a big problem. Again, as I mentioned, he's told to occupy where John Gary's division was, but John Gary never really had a formal battle position there. He just stops there for the night, gets up early in the morning on the 2nd, moves over to Culp's Hill with the rest of his corps. So Gary is a division commander. Uh, he has a division Corps. with the 12th yeah. Corps who are put there temporarily to kind of hold the left, I guess, what, in support of Buford's cavalry? Yeah. Just, who's further out on the Emmitsburg Road? Yeah, they're out by the Peach Orchard. And, and the, but Meade has ordered the entire army here, and they're right. still arriving. Right. Um, the 2nd Corps arrives early in the morning uh, Around the or the night before, around the big round top area. The next morning, they're going to move further up Cemetery Ridge. So, the army is not in place yet on the morning of July second. They're still moving in, and that's the where Gary's division was told to stop for the night on July first. The second, you know, Meade's going to put the Twelfth Corps over on Culp's Hill. Gary's told to get his men up and move to the rest of your corps, and then he tells Sickles, whose men have filtered in through the night. We want you to occupy Gary's spot. You know, I, I, I don't know what Sickles is thinking, but he tells me, well, Gary never really had a spot. Can you help me out here? And there's a lot of confusion back and forth. And I like George Meade. Yeah. I like him a lot, yeah, which too. is pretty good. I'm from Virginia. Got Robert E. Lee on my tag. <laughs> I'm going to keep it, too. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I like George Meade a lot. But George Meade bears partial responsibility for this at one point during the day he sends his son captain Meade, down to talk to sickles sickles is in his tent taking a nap me captain Meade said you know he's he's in his tent resting well this is what the commanding officer wants he says well you know i'll relay that to to uh dan there Meade goes back and reports to his father what was said he said no go back down there and you tell him this is what I want. So Meade rides back down the line. They're trying to... It's all this back and forth. Now, I realize Meade is busy, but by now, Meade has to know he has a problem with Sickles. And he knows Sickles. Mm-hmm. He knows what, he was in cahoots with Hooker and Butterfield and all them. So Meade should have found time in his day. All right, I got to go down here and see what's going on. Because there might be some skirmishing going on. There is at the Bliss Farm. But there's no real battle going on yet. While you got the time and it's fairly quiet, go down there and talk to him yourself. From commanding general to corps commander, and that would. Now I'm glad he didn't, because what stories would we have? Yeah, I wouldn't yeah, have any yeah. stories to tell if he got so, into the compliance. But from yeah. a from a historic, still have Barlow. You can talk about him. <laughs> yeah, I don't true. get out to Barlow. Then Barlow would be the sickles of the battlefield. Yeah. yeah, or of the battle. I understand Barlow a little bit more than uh sickles so it's the same sort of situation but i understand it more um but you know me should have come down himself he doesn't so there's a lot of confusion and at some point during the day sickles sends out a reconnaissance force 
first U.S. sharpshooters in uh, Third Maine. It's about two to three hundred men. He's going to send them over to Pitzer's Woods, which is uh, from modern day visitors off of West Confederate Avenue, where the amphitheater is. Yeah, where the amphitheater is, and you know they stopped and used the porta potties, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but he sends them over there, and they run into Cadmus Wilcox, Alabamians. So Sickles knows Confederates are over there in those woods. And if you stand down on, uh, if you stand at the Trossel Farm, if you stand down uh, north of the Wheatfield, along Wheatfield Road, and you look to the west, you can tell the ground rises. That's high ground. Now, not ever all high ground is made the same. I would vehemently argue there's a huge difference between Little Round Top and Cemetery Hill mm-hmm. as far as importance. Just because they're hills doesn't mean they're equal. Mm-hmm. But there's this high ground in front of Sickles. Sickles knows that Confederates are in these woods. They're off to his right front. Sometime during the morning, John Buford's cavalrymen have been set away. So now Sickles doesn't have any flank protection on his left flank because the cavalry's gone. Pleasanton was supposed to replace them. He doesn't. Pleasanton, and the cavalry, cavalry commander, commander yeah. overall. So nervous Nellie Sickles gets a little antsy, and he decides at some point to move out. And, you know, I he's nervous Nellie, and he, you know, he's just antsy. I, I can see why he'd want to move out. I also, as a former, you know, retired master sergeant, you were told to stay here until the guy comes and tells you you can move out. You don't move out. Mm -hmm. You know, he's Mm -hmm. trying to get sanctioned for this. He gets Henry Hunt involved in this good spot. Please tell me I can stay here. And Hunt wisely says, I don't have that authority. It's a good spot for artillery, though. Henry Hunt is the chief of artillery, so he's on Meade's staff, but he's a brigadier general. Right? Yep. He's not a major general. No, no. Yeah, he's brigadier right. general. So he's not even the same rank. He's a rank below Sickles. But he has that authority has, over all the artillery. Right. So he has... But he doesn't have the authority to say to a corps commander, go ahead, move out here. And that's what he tells Sickles, basically. Yeah. You know, paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah, I don't have that authority. But it's a good spot for artillery. And that's what I know. Right. And, and it right, is. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as... I'm concerned it's good for artillery, but I can't tell you what it is for infantry, and I don't have the authority to tell you to move out here. So by the time Barksdale's brigade gets to that area around Millerstown Road where it crosses over modern West Confederate near Warfield Ridge, uh, north of that, when their their commanders pop out, they see Sickles' corps lined up along the Emmitsburg Road and angling off towards Devil's Den. Now, Sickles really... On that southern end of his line, he doesn't have enough men. He's got two brigades down there, Hobart Ward and uh, Regis de Trobriand's brigades. It's not enough men to hold that. And that area is going to encompass uh, part of the wheat field, excuse me, part of the peach orchard, the wheat field, and Devil's Den. As much as I love the wheat field, I love giving tours in the wheat field, it's useless ground for the Confederates. Devil's Den is worse. It doesn't help them achieve their objective for the day, which is Cemetery Hill. And this is the law of unintended consequence. Sickles doesn't know that. He doesn't know what the Confederates are doing. He just gets nervous and says, they're going to roll me up if I don't move out here. And they're going to put their artillery in the peach orchard and fire at my boys. Mm-hmm. Well, they're going to do that anyways, it turns out. But I was going to say, yeah. They do that, but they end up expending a ton of men and material and energy in places that do them no good. And I I, 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 I cautioned using the word useless because so many men died in that area, you know, and I don't want to ever say that they died in vain. Right, right. So it's, it's militarily, it's useless ground. It right. doesn't help them achieve their objective. And I, Little Round Top doesn't even do that. Right. Right. So, right. Because their point is not to. And so going back then to what got us on the Sickles tangent, you said that, uh, you know, Sickles being out the way he is, his left flank is in an area where Confederates have no business being. And that's going to be on Devil's Den. Yeah. Hobart Ward's brigade is going to be anchoring his line on Devil's Den. Yep. The fourth main. But it's in the air, as they say. Well, it's not necessarily in the air because Uh it's got Little Round Top to the left. Now, while there's nobody up there, that is a huge landmass. Yeah. It's different than Barlow's right. 
to be it. make a comparison, there is no landmass that you can anchor on. You can you can so anchor words, on a hill. Ward could fall back to Little Round Top if he had to. Yeah, it's harder for the Confederates to get around to Ward's left to get around and square it up perpendicular. Yes, they can't yes. do that with that big hill. You can anchor on a landmass like that, just like you can anchor on a major river, yeah. like the Rappahannock or Rapidan down in Virginia. Um, versus Barlow, there's a little creek out there, and the Confederates are going to get across that really quick. You can't anchor on that. So Barlow's right is really in the air. Sickles' left is not really in the air. It's anchored on this landmass, but in between that point and... And the apex of the salient at the peach orchard, he doesn't have enough men. He's trying to bolster that line with, with a lot of artillery, but you, he doesn't have enough men to man that line properly. It's, just, it's not in the air. It's just a weak line. Okay, got it. Yeah. So, um, uh, and the reason you say that the Confederates have no business being there is because their objective is Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Hill. But Sickles being where he is forces, as you pointed out, Hood to move further south to get online because now he has to deal with these guys. And they've been told we need to get on their left flank yeah. and drive northeast. Now, that 4 o'clock tax, that's when the, the infantry is going to launch their assault. That's Law's Brigade. Um, they're not going to go northeast. They're going to go due east because they have Union sharpshooters firing at them. And they sort of pull them back to the western shoulder of Big Round Top. And then they go over the top, and some of them join up with the uh, 20th Maine. Um, but they they bring them, they bring the Confederate force to Big Round Top. Law, or um, the Alabamian, what's his name? Just lost me. Oates? Oates, Warren Oates gets up there, and they want to turn that into a Gibraltar. They're told, no, no, you can't stay here. William. We got to attack. William Oates. William Oates, is that it? You said Warren. Warren? Yeah. That's an actor. Yeah. <laughs> I love my movies. You've been watching your old movies Warren lately. Oates is a good guy. Wild Bunch? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Oates wants to turn it into a Gibraltar. And I said, no, that's the hill we want to get. Yeah. Well, they want to get the hill because that's where the Union Army is. They're attacking these areas because that's where the Union forces are. So it's are. not because Little Round Top, they see any kind of value in it that they want to grab it. No, it's and it's... It's taken on this mythical thing, and it's almost accidental. Yeah, it, it seems uh, quite again, accidental. Not to, not to, uh, you know, take away anything from the lives lost up there, but they had no business attacking that hill. Yeah, no business attacking. And then Devil's Den is the worst of the three. Little Round Top, Devil's Den, and the wheat field. Devil's Den is. What are you going to do from the big rocks? You know, you you should have stayed there, opened up a concession stand, and wait for all the tourists to show up, <laughs> and made your money while you could. You know, <laughs> get a little pet and zoo with the snakes you've captured, <laughs> but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything for them. Right, right, right. So it's just the only spot is the peach orchard. They do get that, and when Barksdale's men, see Barksdale's brigade is the brigade that adheres to Lee's original plan. When they bust through the peach orchard, and they do it fairly quickly, mm -hmm. three of his regiments turn to the northeast, and their left is on the Emmitsburg Road, mm -hmm. and they're they're headed their way. They're now, the 21st Mississippi is on the right of Barksdale's brigade. They continue east, more or less. Yeah. Eventually, they sort of torn to the northeast, but they're separated from the other three brigades of Barksdale, and... Uh, and then Barksdale's going to hang another right and head towards the east, and that's where he's going to run into uh, Willard's brigade. But he tries to adhere to the, the battle plan for whatever reason, um, but it just doesn't work out. Yeah, it's well, not enough at that it's point. It's not enough, yeah. And the, having said all that, because Sickles moves out, because his line gets broke down there, there's a gaping hole in the Union line. Mm -hmm. And so there is an opportunity... And I think if A.P. Hill is more active and he sends his brigades in like Longstreet did with depth, there is an opportunity to exploit that hill or the hole because they don't have nearly as far to go. They're coming across the Pickett's Charge Fields that we call today, those, that area, and they can get there faster. And there's once Andrew Humphrey's division is broke from 
the Emmitsburg Road, and they're broke by Barksdale, and then Wilcox comes and, and pushes them along. Once that happens, any further on brigades coming east are going to get to the Union line without suffering a huge amount of damage because a lot of the artillery has been overrun. So that's that's my what if. I don't care about Cemetery Hill on the first day. Yeah, but if they get there, as Ambrose Wright said, he got just as far as he thought he could get, but he didn't have any support. So but if you end if, up with the same problem? Well, if you stack these brigades and attack, attack with depth like Longstreet did, behind every brigade Longstreet sends in, there's one behind it coming on. Turns out they're all Georgians along the line. If you do that, I think you have a chance. And if they have a chance of any of the three days, I think that's the opportunity. And I think it peters out around Carnet Posey's Mississippi Brigade at the Bliss Farm. They're squabbling over this farm still. So one of those regiments breaks free and joins on the left of right where it should have been a brigade. You just got a regiment of Mississippians coming up on right's left, and that's it. See, it, that in echelon attack peters out, Breaks then it down. magically jumps over to Culp's Hill. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it completely misses the center there. They send up a flare. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. So Devil's Den then. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit on Devil's Den. Well, but actually, before we focus on that, Roseanne, is there anything you'd like to share about the, the townsfolk as we progress into the day? Any good anecdotes or thoughts or anything? Well, a lot of them are just trying their best to, to stay safe. Um, the Garlock family, for example, on July 1st had gone down to the Shriver house um, because they had water in their cellar. But uh, Hetty Shriver leaves. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, six questions had asked yesterday, you know, were people able to, to leave once, you know, um, the battle was beginning? And, uh, you know, Hetty Shriver, of course, was one of those who did, along with Tilly. But, uh, you know, July 2nd rolls around and Anna decides she's going to stay in her basement with all the water. So uh, what is she going to do? How is she going to stay dry down there? Well, yeah. um, some uh, her husband, I think, is a carpenter, and there are some wood out back, you know, some logs. They roll them down into the cellar. I mean, very um, creative yeah. problem yeah. solver because yeah. her husband is up there on Cemetery Hill. You know, he's out there July 1st trying to figure out what's going on, and, you know, he decides he wants to come back to town, and it's like, not so fast, buddy. You're staying here. <laughs> so she had no idea where he was. Yeah. So in the meantime, you know, she's trying to hold down the fort, and they roll these logs down into the cellar as water all over because as you know these are not man caves these cellars right <laughs> you know, they're low they're damp they're dark um, and wasn't there a creek that ran under those houses like it's not just her no it's not just hers yeah uh, i think it had rained before but uh, someone was telling me um to even today that and don't, I mean, I, it, this is just like from the recesses of my mind, so I don't even have all the details. But they can't do anything to impede the water flow. I yes. don't know if they still have those problems yes. today. I, I believe know. I was told the same thing. So, you know, she's down there and she stands the logs on end and brings in some boards and creates a platform. So now they're able to stay dry despite all the water underneath them. Uh, she's got three families down there, and they're down there as long as the firing is going on. But, you know, still very, very curious. And she's been very careful for the most part. She had a Confederate that ran into her house wanting to use her attic as a, a sharpshooting position, as the Shriver house had been, and um, the Sweeney house. And, and you know, she's very brave. She grabs him by his coattails. She says, you can't go up there. And we're a house of women and children. You're going to bring fire down upon us. Hey. And he's looking at her like, lady, I'm not running back out in the street again. Right. I'm going to get shot. Right. So, you know, what he does is, uh, you know, he creates some cover for himself. He, he does fire his musket, you know, and in that puff of smoke, he disappears. But, you know, I mean, she stood up to him, wouldn't let him. But nonetheless, uh, her son decides he wants to see what's going on. And, you know, I don't understand. She's been so careful all along. They go up to the attic and she pulls back this board over the attic window. And no sooner does, you know, they see that motion and, you know. Uh. And, and the, in the comes, bullets come uh, flying in. So that was the end. You know, curiosity kills the Yeah, cat. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was the end of her curiosity as far yeah. as that is concerned. And, so uh, she and she went up to the Shriver house with her family on eventually July 1st. on July 1st. Because, OK, gotcha. And um, yeah, that that water. So, yeah, I think I was I think it was 
Nancy Goodman started at I the Schreiber so House was, who told yes. me the story. I think yeah, I heard it on a Kirsten Getty's oh, oh, that might have been it. <laughs> yeah. I heard it. You better play back. Is that a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to listen. I should it take sucks. notes. Instead it's a of terrible podcast. Instead of committing it to memory. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, I, I think it was. It was uh, that was the story. It was that uh, there, there was a creek, of or a spring or whatever you call it, you know, underground or the houses were built over it or whatever, and all the basements were open and they had it going through there, kind of like if you go to the Cash Town Inn now and you go into the basement there. I think that's more of a spring, but still, <laughs> same idea. Um, okay, so Can I ask a question. Yeah, I feel like Merv Griffin now. Um, does anybody write like? For the third, Professor Michael Jacobs famously writes, you know, at 1.07 p.m., two cannon go off, and all of a sudden, you know, the hell's open up, heaven's open up. Does anybody write about this day two artillery fight centered around the peach orchard? Because that was, Alexander says that's the most fiercest artillery fight he had during the entire war, and that's a lot of firing, and I'm wondering if anybody took note of that. They did. Um... They were talking about the cannonading. They could feel the vibrations. The house was shaking. And now I guess we know that the windows also <laughs> were uh, shot out. They were breaking. From the, but, yes, they did talk about the sound, um, that it was, uh, I think it was Albert McCreary who was talking about, you know, if you, you just took a, a spoon and was banging it down. A fa- I mean, they were talking about how loud it was and yeah. the, the vibrations that yeah. they could feel. And, uh, you know, that's what kept them down there in the cellar. And even uh, as the shells are flying over the house, I mean, people don't realize how many actually landed in the house. I mean, the houses have been repaired, but sure. many of them talk about... Um, you know, I was here, and five minutes later I moved, and, you know, five minutes after I moved, in comes the show where I was standing. But uh, Fanny Beeler's young son, I think he was about two years old, his name is Allie, and he hears the the shells whistling overhead, and he is, oh, Mommy, listen to the birdies. Mm. You know, to (laughs) him they sounded like birds. Birds, all right. (laughs) A bunch of vultures coming to eat you, buddy. No, but, um, you know, they were just doing their best to to stay out of the line of fire. Some of them, though, um, braved that fire. Yeah, Agnes like Barr is one of them. Uh, you know, here they are again. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough supplies. And let me go across the street. She's on Baltimore Street. See what my neighbor has, and her family saying, "You know, like I don't think that's a good idea." Uh, but nonetheless, she runs across the street. The Confederates are there you know, in the alley, and they're you know like their 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 jaws are dropping. Like right. I can't believe this crazy woman is running across the street. You know, she could be shot yeah. by a sharpshooter. And she gets to the neighbor's house across the street, and of course, you know, they don't have any bread either because they don't have yeast, I guess. And uh, <laughs> they say, "No, no, no, Agnes, you have to stay here. We can't let you go back." home and she's saying nah I think I'm going to go home and she does again you know the reverse um, I don't know if you ever saw the movie In-Laws uh, with no. Peter Falk and oh it's it's, it's a classic okay. you have to watch it sometime I, I do like Peter Falk so they, they get off the plane they're in some yeah, another thing. country and, and um, you know they're being shot at so um you know, it's uh, Alan Arkin and Peter Falk, and it's serpentine, Shelly serpentine, meanwhile, you know, <laughs> running all over the place in these bullets. So ever, I just imagine, um, you know, Agnes, Agnes Bard serpentining <laughs> across <laughs> right. Baltimore Street, and, you know, and, and the Confederates are like, you know, cheering her on. Go, Yay, girl. lady, come yeah. on, you can do it, you can do it, Agnes. And uh, she said she finally makes it to her front door, and, you know, here, here's the mini balls uh, shooting past her. And, of course, you know, up there on, on Cemetery Hill, you know, they don't know who they're shooting at. They just see, uh, at movement, that point, yeah, movement. Yeah. So they're going to shoot at anything that moves. So she really was uh, one of the braver ones, I think, uh, to take chances like that. Was it, I don't know if it was July 2nd or July 3rd, uh, there's a woman who was shot, what, I think through the hip, crossing the street. Are you familiar with this story? No, but um, I don't know of that story, but it's certainly one I could follow it up on. It could be a, something I imagine. I mean, Agnes was not harmed. Very Many of them were very, very close calls. Yeah. And... Um, it's not that they underestimated. I guess maybe they overestimated their own ability yeah. to stay safe. Or, or I mean, you know, I, I get a sense from some of the, the civilian things that I read or hear is that, you know, even when it's all going on and you're seeing the death and destruction around you, it's still not sinking in that it could also kill you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, a lot of them, you know, um, especially uh, I'm, I mean, uh, some of the younger boys, you know, they would go, they'd be carrying water into the hospital, and, you know, the, the courthouse, for example, was a hospital, and you know, seeing the wounded there and the amputations that are going on, it, it, it at first was 
a shock. Yeah. And then he just said, well, you know, after a while, I kind of got used to it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and Sally Myers sort of said the same thing. Um, and she's talking about how she uh, just did, just liked the sight of blood. And, and then she wrote later, I was soon destined to become acquainted with it. Because how do you avoid it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you are in a situation where Sarah Rod had said, you know, we didn't think we could do these things. We didn't think we would be able to rise to the occasion. Sure. But we did. Yeah. Because the circumstances demanded it, we were able to meet them. I remember I was talking to a colonel one time, and we were just talking. And, you know, we're talking about, uh, obviously, the battle here and everything. And, and I said, uh, I said, you know, I don't think I could do any of that. Like, I really don't think I could do it. And he goes, you know, you'd be surprised at what you can do when you're actually faced with a situation. And he's like, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't count yourself out just yet. And I said, well, I don't want to count myself in <laughs> with anything. <laughs> well, you could have just stayed in your man cave. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, all right. So, uh, back to the battlefield now. So, uh, devil's den, uh, when hood's division steps off, they're in place. They step off. Law's brigade goes first, right? Yep. And who's next in line? Robertson, right? Jerome Robertson, and now, Texas. And, and that's not... Now, you, they're, double, they're in double lines. So we've got, like you said before, brigade in front of brigade. And what, Hood's got four brigades? Yes. So, so behind Evander Law is Benning's brigade. Benning. Rock Benning. There you go. And then next the to him... The former fort. ...is Teague Anderson's brigade. <laughs> and like I said... The second line of the four brigades that are in the front line are all Georgians. Yeah, just, just the way it worked out. Yeah, I guess so. But now, so the idea of that is the first brigades go in, not at the same time, though, correct? No, Evander Law's brigade and Robertson's brigade step off about 4 o'clock. Okay, together. And, and, say again? Together? I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, no, they do, because they because, get mixed up, yeah. don't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they get mixed mixed up for a reason, yeah. Um, yeah. And then coming further north along their line would be Kershaw's Brigade. And that's about 5 o'clock. And then further on north, that's Barksdale at 6 o'clock. So, and then times are, of course, taken with a grain of salt. But those are the, you know, roundabout times that they all step out. When Evander Law's Brigade attacks, like I said, they attack due east. And then they get on the shoulder of western slope of Big Round Top. They turn north. Captain James Smith's battery of New Yorkers is in Devil's Den. They're above Devil's Den, four of his guns, and then he's got two guns up Plum Run, Plum Run Valley. These guns are tearing into the Confederates to try to take these guns and mitigate that, that threat. Law is going to take the two further right regiments from his brigade and move them around to the left to try to take these guns. So you have the 44th and 48th Alabama moving from the far right to the left to fill the gap in between Robertson's Brigade and Law's Brigade Got coming it. up the Plum Run Valley. That's what puts the 15th Alabama now under William, not Warren, Oates, the far right, and going against Joshua Chamberlain. So, And when that happens, then you have the 4th and 5th Texas then. They move over and link up with the rest of Law's Brigade. They end up attacking Little Round Top, whereas the other two regiments in Robertson's Brigade are the 1st Texas and 3rd Arkansas. So it's the 1st Texas, 3rd Arkansas, 44th Alabama, part of the 48th Alabama attacking Devil's Den. And then you have Benning's Brigade coming behind. You have the uh, 15th Georgia and the 20th Georgia attacking Devil's Den. So... Um, it, an interesting. This is trivia. It doesn't matter. So I, I'm not even going to get it totally right. But I think J uh, Jerome Robertson is the only other Confederate general. He becomes a general who has a son who's a general. His son becomes a general. Okay. The other guy is Robert E. Lee. Huh. I think. Okay. So that's a. I and think the, this, on both sides or just uh, the Confederate. Or just army? the Confederates, as far okay. as I know. All right. Yeah. I think. All right. Well, it's still, it's an interesting thought. But, you know, Hood's, Hood's division is a fighting division. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Texas Brigade has this reputation um, of being one of the fiercest fighters, you know, that he has. Even though it's just three regiments plus 3rd Arkansas thrown in. Um, 
but they're you know the first and third first Texas third Arkansas forty fourth and forty eighth Alabama they're going to be the ones attacking um, Devil's Den and what they are attacking you have the fourth Maine on the very end then you have the hundred twenty fourth New York moving uh, up the up the line and then the um, the uh, 99th PA is originally on the far right of Ward's line. They're going to be pulled from there and put down closer to the 124th New York. So they're the monument that's up on sort of a ledge above Smith's Battery. Mm -hmm. So there's a thought that, um, and you can find people, Tim Smith, anybody smarter than me, that can tell you if this is true, that Smith's Battery actually was deployed up on that ledge. Because afterwards, when they come to dedicate Smith's battery, somebody asked Hunt about it, or I think, and Hunt says, you know, I would have fired you if you put your guns here. <laughs> they were up here. This is just where we put the monument. Right. And that wouldn't surprise me because there are plenty of monuments, not necessarily in the spot they should be. It's right. just how they are. Yeah. Um, but the 90, uh, 90th PA is up on, or 99th PA is up on that ledge. That's that monument. Yeah. Um, so they moved down, and that's who these Texans in Arkansas, Arkansians, I guess, and Alabamians are going to attack on these rocks. And you, most folks have been to Devil's Den. Uh, it's got these huge rocks. And so you've got to clamor over them. Um, eventually, there's going to be Union troops on uh, Little Round Top. You've got gun cannon up on Little Round Top. Um, you've got Smith's battery right in front of you. So... It's just hard fighting down there. It's not your typical George Pickett sending his division across these big open fields mm -hmm. like it's going to happen the next day. Yeah, it's just yeah. unforgiving territory that you're trying to fight. I know at one point, a um, soldier in the first Texas named Barber, I think he's a private, he might be a sergeant. I, I didn't look it up before I came, but his name is Barber. There's a rock, big rock down there near the triangular field. It's at the southern end of that field, and he gets angry, and he jumps up on the rock. Somebody hands him a rifle, and he shoots at the uh, the Union forces, probably the 124th New York. And then somebody else hands him a rifle, and he gets shot off the rock. And he said, just stay here. No, he gets, <laughs> he gets his dander up, and he climbs back up on the rock. Somebody hands him a loaded rifle, and he shoots again. He does this like three or four times before they permanently knock him out. <laughs> and it's just... He just he's mad yeah. and he climbs up on this rock. You can't help but get shot. You're up on this of rock. Of course, making a target. Yeah. yeah. Um and then one of um one of the most I, I, I don't know how famous it is. Let me get the names right. I, I know the names, but I want to make sure I get them in order. Um it, it involves the hundred and twenty fourth New York, the orange blossoms. And I don't think the story gets told enough. I, you know, I'm guilty of that too. I don't go around telling the story because not all tours make their way down there. Although now they do um, because um, Little Round Top's closed. Yeah, yeah. So, 124th New York is commanded by Colonel A. Van Horn Ellis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He is their commander. And now, let me get their major's name. I apologize for not being more prepared. Now I have to go Bike through tours. this episode and find this part because I can't mark it with my recorder like we do in the studio. So now you're making more work for me, Lewis. Damn it. I apologize. Unless me and Roseanne. How about this? Roseanne, you got anything that we can uh, well, fill some yes. time with? Okay, go ahead. I have a lot. <laughs> I'm certain that we talked about people staying in their cellars and that they were fairly safe in their cellars. Mm -hmm. uh, one man in particular was in his cellar and I don't know how safe it was for him to be there. And we're talking about John Rupp. Mm. Um, he was actually in the middle of the battle. You know, today his home is the children's museum, children of 1863 interactive museum, which is a great place to go. If yes. you're a young kid. And even if you were a child, even at if heart, you're an old kid, you're it's an a cool old place. Kid. It's yeah. fun to go. Yep. And and uh, he wrote a letter to his sister afterwards. Now, on July 1st, his family was there. He sends his family away down Baltimore Street, I think, to his father's house. It's further away, considered safe, but he stays. And again, the question is, why do people stay and why 
do they go? Obviously, I'm going to leave because I don't want to get shot. But on the other hand, if I stay, chances were that your house would not be looted. So he stays and he is in the cellar. And most people look at the house today, they don't realize that is not the house that was there at the time of the battle. Mm. The house that was there at the time of the battle is one just like Mr. D's. Right. It looks exactly the same. And it was facing, oriented uh, in, in the same direction as sort of Mr. G's is. So, um, you, and he writes to his sister. He says, I had the Confederates at my back door. And I had the Union soldiers at my front door. And they are firing through the hallway. And I am in the cellar, and I am on neutral ground. <laughs> now, the Union soldiers knew he was there. The Confederates did not. Okay. But, you know, it was very deadly because when he finally emerges from his cellar, he talks about having dead soldiers mm. on his property. So, you know, so that was a very forward position for many of the civilians. The Weinbrenners themselves, you know, just across the street, they were told to stay in the basement, the cellar, the whole mm. time. Right. Uh, which they did. And, and you know, uh, Martin Luther Culler is in there. He was a friend of the family, and he's complaining, well, they took all the food. And all we had, we didn't even have coffee. <laughs> so uh, that was also a problem. But they could hear the Confederates above them running through the house. They could hear, um, you know, the, the sharpshooting going on from the porches. Um, another soldier uh, just at the Samuel McCreary house, just up across the street from um, the Rupp house. You know, he's up there on, on, on that porch. And, you know, he figures, well, I'm too exposed here to the fighting that's going on to uh, from the wagon hotel then he drags a, a table out a drop leaf table and he puts it right there on on that porch and he figures well this is going to protect me well no it didn't because he ends up um getting shot yeah, and and yeah. you know, mortally shot and the family that was there you know they have to drag his body out and you know, they have to bury him yeah. so you know the civilians that were there just because they were in the cellar doesn't necessarily mean that they were out of any danger or out of any kind of, um, you know, responsibility for caring for the wounded that they may have found or the dead that might have been in their backyards. You know. How you, it, go ahead. You know what's great is that you can now sort of experience what that must have been like in this fabulous new museum yes, <laughs> just yes. outside town. That's right. Am I allowed to say that? Of course. <laughs> yeah. And I got to go through there with your show, yep. and it was amazing. Yeah, and you can hear the footsteps and the running and pew, you know, boom, boom. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I'm a docent there, and that's my job. Oh, I'm the one that opens the red door. Oh, look at that. oh yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I, well, like my middle name is Volunteer. <laughs> you know, when I'm not guiding, uh, I, I volunteer. Okay, and so um, you know, and they have the video, excellent video. Yes, it's all well done. However, it, you know, it runs on a five-minute loop. So, and I've You've had, memorized it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I'm there two and a half hours, and I've done about 11 shifts so far. So, <laughs> um, But yes, it, it is. And you know, you, when you go inside, you, you've been there. Yeah. There's a table with the food on it. And you know, of course, we explain that the family's in the basement. And yeah. someone says, well, well whose way, house the- was that? Well, I honestly think it could have been uh, the David McCreary house, Albertus's father. They left their meal. Um, you know, on July 1st yeah. when the retreat was happening or actually when the soldiers were going through town they're giving out water and then when the retreat happens uh, you know they go down into their cellar but they left their their meal on the table and what ended up happening is as they're down in the cellar and this on July 1st again the Confederates come in and you know do you have any Union soldiers in your house looking for prisoners of war oh no I don't have any of them well let's go check and of course they go in the house and the Confederates do find the Union soldiers and it's getting very tents in there and how they get there yeah mr mccurry decides well how am i going to diffuse this oh yeah. look my meal is on the table why don't we all sit down and have <laughs> a meal together that's some good thinking yes yeah. and and uh he did and and you know the temperature really did end up uh you know uh, he diffused the situation let's put it that way and uh they had a great meal and then the meal's over and they are taken as prisoner of war uh but so they have a meal with them, and then they capture them. Yeah, so I, honestly, nice. I really think, you know, what might be nicest, you know, we've got the meal on the table there at the museum. Maybe just have some Confederates come yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, really it's, make it a... It's good yeah. to have you there with the knowledge of the town, because yes. that's what that's replicating, yeah. yep. uh, to dispense all this stuff. Because if I'm in there... I don't know. Just don't touch this stuff, man. <laughs> and then move along when it's over. You know, we got more people waiting. But it's you can give them all that background stuff. Um so it's more than just the experience of standing there and hearing these shells. They're mm-hmm. actually getting 
information they wouldn't have otherwise gotten, I don't right. think. Oh, yeah. Many of so, them come yeah. in with questions, and, you know, that's the purpose of the docents. I had no, to answer those questions. no intention of uh, promoting this place, but it came no. up, and it, it's excellent. And I don't know if uh, you actually said the name. We're talking about the Adams County Historical Society's Gettysburg Beyond the Battle Museum, uh, just north of town on the Carlisle Road. Can't miss it. It looks like a big farmhouse and barn. Beautiful building, awesome stuff in there. Um, yeah, go ahead and uh, check them out. Now I got to hit them up and see if they want to be the sole sponsor of the show. Since we <laughs> <laughs> hey, they should invite me to do something since I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm not smart enough, man. Uh-huh. So okay, so we uh, uh, where do we? Okay, did you find what you were looking yeah, for? Yeah, one one twenty fourth. So they're there. And if you drive past Smith's Battery, the next monument you come to along that road on the right, sitting up on a rock, is the 124th New York. Um, so, and if you look to the left, there's an open area. That's called the Triangular Field. When the weeds are cut, you can see the rocks that make up the three sides mm-hmm. of the Triangular Field. Um, and so, First Texas is coming up through there. They're attempting to capture Smith's guns. Because these guns are, you know, wrecking havoc on them and such. So they're getting up there and they're getting close. So Major James Cromwell of the 124th goes to Colonel Van Horn Ellis and says, I think we need to charge these guys because we're not going to be able to stop them. And they're getting close. We just wait here. And so originally, um, I don't think Van Ellis wanted to do this because he knows, yeah, this is bad news. But then he agrees and... um, Van Ellis and Cromwell are both on horseback. They lead this charge over that first stone wall into the triangular field to knock back these Texans to stop them. And that allows Smith perhaps to get out of there. But it it blunts their momentum. And I bring this up, and I I think it's important, because they lose their lives right there. And they have to know that there's a a fair chance we're not going to make it out of this, but we need to do this, and we need to get these men up and moving and Mm. it takes me back to the movie (laughs) I love the movie I caveat that but more and more I criticize things in the movie sure and one of the things I criticize is the scene with Hancock there are times when a corps commander's life doesn't matter you got a colonel and a major with that sentiment and they're putting it in action they're just Mm -hmm. not riding around on a ridge during our artillery barrage they are leading a charge on horseback knowing presumably there's a good chance we're going to give our lives back here but they do it without hesitation and they die and then the story is van Elst's body gets carried back before it's moved further back it's placed on that rock where the monument now rests so when they come back to put their monument up they place it on the same rock where their commander once laid when he was dead okay and I so it's that. just uh it's stories like that that again I, you know i'm guilty you know got a certain amount of time to tell three days worth of battle and you do the best you can we don't get down there when little round tops open up um and so that's one of those sort of obscure stories that i think would better if it came out more would be beneficial you know yeah for to honor those two men um it's important i think yeah i agree all right so the, uh, the 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 fighting at Devil's Den. Everybody loves to go to Devil's Den. It's a lot of fun to uh, climb on the rocks there. It looks cool. It's such an odd outcropping of rocks and things like that. But uh, kids love it. As far as the fighting itself, was it fierce? Was it befitting the name Devil? Well, I don't think the name Devil has anything to do with the fighting. Of course not. But um, was but it still befitting? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's just hard terrain. Um, and, again, it's, it's vastly different from the fighting you're going to have on July 3rd mm-hmm. across these open fields where you've got fences in your way, yes, but you don't have these giant, like, from outer space boulders that, you, you know, you've never seen before and you're trying to fight over this ground. And because of that reason, these giant boulders, again, where they're trying to get to, it's useless ground. The Confederates are going to capture Devil's Den. Um, but it doesn't tactically do them any favors and they expend these fierce fighting Confederate brigades simply because they're trying to find the left of the Union line and that's where it's at. It, it, that's all it amounts to. That place is attacked because that's where the Union Army is. 
And what do you attack? You attack the enemy. Right. And so now this is uh, something that didn't cross my mind a lot until we did the get out of the car tour last year. We did the U.S. regulars. Right. right. And the Pennsylvania reserves. By the time they're coming through there, the Confederates occupy Devil's Den. They've knocked the rest of Ward's brigade out of there. So when the regulars are sweeping across their front from right to left, approaching the wheat field, they're firing into the flank of the U.S. regulars. And I know the 14th U.S. regular is going to take a lot of uh, wounded men from this and partially the 12th U.S. regulars. They're going to get a lot of casualties, not just from what's in front of them, but what's coming from their left flank. And that's the uh, Confederates are occupying Devil's Den now. You got these Texans in, in Third Arkansas are firing at you. Yeah. Some Georgians probably in there too. So then the Pennsylvania Reserves come down. There's the same thing. They're getting fire on their left flank that they have to worry about, along with what's in front of them. So they do use it that position uh, against Union forces later in the day. But again, I can't harp on it enough. It does nothing to further them getting to their objective. Okay. So, so how long would you say the fighting at Devil's Den takes place? I wouldn't say very long because it's over by the time the regulars come sweeping through there. And so Wofford's brigade is going to come down the Wheatfield Road probably around 7 o'clock, I'd say, between 6.30 and 7. And that's going to precipitate the Pennsylvania Reserves coming across there. And so the, the Confederates have occupied Devil's Den definitely when the Pennsylvania Reserves are coming across their front. Um, so probably anywhere from an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Um, it's just fierce fighting. And probably what takes it so long is these big rocks. You can't get on any edge because of the rock. You know what I'm sure, saying? You sure. can't get on your opponent's flank like you'd normally try to right. do. It's a head-on with these big obstacles in the way. Um, eventually, Smith's going to have to pull his battery out of there. He's got the two further up Plum Run Valley. They're going to help with the retreat, uh, holding the uh, Confederates at bay. They moved the 40th New York that was originally on Stony Hill down to plug the gap, plug the hole, if you will, in between Devil's Den and Little Round Top along Plum Run Valley. That's through the Valley of Death. Right, um, right. So they're down there, too, and that's going to slow things down. But I probably an hour or so. It can't be that long. Okay. Yeah. I mean, most most of the fighting is not very long. Yeah. And again, um, you know, Kershaw's brigade is going to sweep down through there and push the regulars back with the help of Wofford. Because Wofford's going to come down and get in behind the right flank of the regulars. And by then, the Confederates fully occupied Devil's Den. And so that's... Again, between 6.30 and 7, maybe. So the uh, Ward's Brigade on Devil's Den is the left of Sickles' line. Yes. That's first contact is made there with the Confederates with the Ward's Brigade, right? In that area. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then eventually uh, more of the Confederates join the attack and come across the fields and make contact with um, uh, Sickles' men. Uh, it, the, the the line rolls west from there, west northwest. I'd say because you've east. got Kershaw. No, we're moving. Oh, you east t- to you're west. talking Sickles line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, the end being the fourth main of Hob- Hobart Ward's brigade, and then moving towards our left. If you're facing their line to the left, to the west. Yep, yep. And then Kershaw launches his attack about five o'clock, and so he's going to come across. He's going to hit. He's going to divert a couple regiments to the north towards the Peach Orchard, the gun line up there, and the rest of them go towards the Rose Farm and the Rose House, the, the barn and the house. The, because where we are. They've, there's Union Army down there. It's Detroit Brianne's Brigade. They're on the Stony Hill, and he's, he, they're, you got to get them out of the way. Yeah. So they're attacking through there. Kershaw is really the only Confederate in the area trying to exercise control. At one point, he tries to go back and get the brigade of Paul Sims to join up with him. He's wondering where he's at. When Hood goes down, and General Hood goes down early in the fight, um, 
Evander Law is elevated to division command. It takes a while for anybody to get Evander Law and let him know you're in charge now, not just this, but the whole line here with this division. So command and control is an issue. And in the wheat field, the Union Army is doing no better. There's really nobody exercising command and control, maybe until Caldwell's division from the Second Corps is pulled out of line and sent south to try to bolster that line in the wheat field. And he's the one that's he sends his whole division in. He's trying to exercise um, control. He's trying to work with the Fifth Corps. Um, so that's chaotic. At the end of the day, Confederates are going to occupy Stony Hill. Union Army is going to occupy Hawks Ridge. And then you have this no man's land in mm-hmm. between. Just dead, dying and wounded men out here in this wheat field. 26 acres of former wheat. It was gone by this point. Um, and like I said, I, me- I think I mentioned earlier, I think it might be my, my favorite spot on the field. If I had to pick one, I usually say my favorite spot is wherever I'm at. <laughs> I like it all. It's a good but, answer. You know? yeah. um, but I love going down there and talking about all the movements. There's a lot going on. But it's a lot going on in a place that it's attacked because that's where Sickles' men are. Right. right? And, you know... But that, that place is almost it's, it's detrimental to the Union cause because they're using the Fifth Corps down there. They're pulling the Second Corps down there. And you're, you're stripping other areas of your line to bolster this, this, this area because it's broke so bad. And that leaves weak points further up the, the red. It's almost like you think of the whole army as, you know, a, a body – but you're looking at it in profile, like a human body in profile. And Sickles' line is like if you extended one of your legs and bent it at the knee. And the peach, or I'm sorry, the wheat field is like uh, a wound occurs in the shinnel area or cavil region. And uh, <laughs> is that uh, official medical? You're a doctor. <laughs> I know. Well, I've been doing medical episodes with Fran and Rick. Dr. Seuss. I'm learning. <laughs> um and and uh, the second and fifth core elements that are going down there are blood clots trying to staunch the wound, and um, because it's just this wide open, and and it's yeah like it's it's I guess Lee is kind of succeeding in inflicting heavier casualties on Union troops that are not supposed to be in this area, right? Like you know because they're being drawn down here. And they're taking a lot of casualties and they're not going to be those, you know, the dead and wounded aren't going to be usable to the Union Army for quite some time, if ever. And um, so, you know, he he's doing something. He's just not as far as gaining the ground that he wants to get. He's really not going to accomplish that. Yeah. And Lee never says, let's take that hill. Let's take that field. Let's take those big rocks. Right. He wants to just he wants to them. get on the left end and he's basing everything off intelligence he had gathered between 4 and 4.30 and 7.30 that morning. Right. And it's now 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. It's, you know, he never adjusts. Yeah. Um, he's like, you know, Longstreet's been described as stubborn, you know, and, and um, once he gets set on something, he's want to leave it, you know, an idea or something. Um once the fighting starts, though, Longstreet is in it. I don't necessarily agree how he sends everybody in. He could have done a better job, but he is in it. Right, right. He's very active. And Lee is almost like, find the left, attack it, and drive to the northeast. But the situation changed. It seems like, he, I, I don't think it's ever been written that he says this, but find the left, attack it, drive northeast. But didn't he usually give his commanders a lot of discretion anyway? He did, and that's his problem during this battle, because he's got two, and this is his, it's his fault. And I got him on my tag over there. <laughs> he doesn't adjust to these two brand new corps commanders, where they are used, especially Yule. Yule served, both of them served, AP Hill and Yule both served under Jackson. Yule is used to, by the book, this is what I want you to do, A, B, C, and D. If you go to E, you're in trouble. A, B, C, and D, don't do anything else. Whereas Lee's saying, well, we got A and we got D, a couple letters in the middle. You get them in order and do it however you want. Just get it done. Right. You know, that's not what Yule is used to. Now, coming up during the campaign, Yule does a good job. Um, however, 
Lee does not adjust to him or AP Hill and say he should have micromanaged those two more. Instead, Instead he's micromanaging yeah. Longstreet. And that's because they're irritated with each other, I think. Um, it, it's just, again, petulant children. Yeah. You let these squabbles get away in the big picture, and when you end up with? A loss. A loss. And you yeah. got to go back home with your tail between your legs. Now, you were in the Army. Is it the job of the uh, commander to uh, adjust to his subordinates, or is it the job of the subordinates to adjust to the commander? It's a little of both, but it's more on the commander, especially the commander that recommended you for promotion. Oh, uh, yeah. Good point. Because he already knows how you are. Right. And he knows how you've acted previous to this. And so he ought to know what you're used to. The thing that he never does, he never sits all three corps commanders down at any point during the battle. Mm-hmm. I mean, Meade does it all the time, for better or worse. And, you know, Meade's new to corps, uh, Army command at this point, so he's trying to get on his feet. Lee does the opposite. I don't know if his illness played into that or anything. He just doesn't micromanage enough, and he should have. And he's a smart enough guy to to realize this. I mean... He was in charge of West Point at one point in his life. He knows right. this stuff. Right. Um, but it's the commander. But if you have questions as you're the subordinate, you got to ask the questions also. Hey, I'm unsure about this. Like yeah. Sickles was trying to do. Yeah. But Sickles was sort of doing it with, you know, politics in his head. Yeah. I don't know. Um, Sickles is probably a, a bad example for me to use since he was a politician. <laughs> um, but it's a little on both, but I think it's more on the – the overall commander, especially in this environment when the stakes are so high, you've got to set yourself up for success. Yep. Instead, what Lee does, he sets his army up for failure. That's a controversial statement. We're going to lose a lot of uh, listeners because of that. I got a Virginia tag with Robert E. Doesn't Lee. Doesn't matter. You're a traitor. It's a good thing it's not a call-in show, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I thought having the Lee tag makes me a traitor. Uh, to the United States. Oh. Yeah, but not now to the, you got to deal with the Southern people that are oh. listening. Hmm. You just can't win, Lewis. I can't win. You just can't win. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think he, you know, the, he picks the wrong time, you know. With these, yeah. with these guys, you know. I got you. Uh, all right. So uh, moving further up the line now, because we, we do we do have a lot to cover on, on uh, July 2nd here. It's not yeah, just yeah, Sickles yeah. and stuff. So let's move on now from the Devil's Den area and uh, the Weedfield area and even the Peach Orchard area. It's, it's suffice to say that the uh, third core position going from Devil's Den up to the Peach Orchard and then cutting north along the Emmitsburg Road, north-ish, along the Emmitsburg Road, uh, falls it it breaks, and the Confederates gain that ground. Um, so, like you pointed out earlier in the episode, they gain the ground that uh, Sickles was trying to deny them of anyway. I often wonder if he had just stayed where he was supposed to be, how this battle would have played out. That'd be he'd, interesting. He'd have the Confederate right flank exposed to him. He would have the Confederate right Cause flank because they're supposed oh, to gain the supposed to, Emmitsburg yeah. Road. Yeah, yeah. So how much damage he inflicts on that? That is if they didn't see him and then make adjustments accordingly. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, the Union Army is not suffering too much as this attack rolls northward. So right. I don't, I don't think that ever was going to happen because, like you say, once they discover that there's this whole line on our right flank, they're going to adjust somehow. Yeah. They're not just going to go up the Emmitsburg Road and uh, allow their right flank to be shredded. Yeah. Um, so that, that, gonna, like, that would never happen. Wave that's, at Sickles' man. That's just what the plan is. And if Sickles stays where he's supposed to, the plan is going to open up that for Sickles' line to expose the, the Confederate right flank. They're not going to allow that to happen. The Confederates aren't. So Right, right. All right. So Sickles is out of the picture. Um, as you mentioned before, uh, Barksdale's brigade uh, goes a little further, uh, like right in front of where the PA monument is today. Yeah, they're in that area, a little bit south of it. Yeah, um, there's that big there's Plum Run comes up there, and there is the the. Um, it's a thicket. It's a the lot Plum more Run th- thicket. A lot more thicket than it was back then. Let me <laughs> tell you. You know, I got this idea, if I can uh, <laughs> diverge a little. You take the beavers from where they are yeah. and put them in the thicket. Put them in the thicket. Let's do that. that. Is thick. Yeah. 
and thin that out, then send them back See, home. I think where the they, Park Service could save a lot of money. Yeah, where their if house If they is move now. the yeah. beavers around. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because then they don't have to go and clear these things. You just put yeah. the beavers there. There'd they'll be do less it. Then you move anti beaver hate. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Use the beavers like like you would goats or cattle in the woods if you wanted to clear or a field if you wanted to clear it out. Just put some goats and cattle. They're there. happy. You're beavers. happy. Yeah. All God's children are happy. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Everybody so, wins. But yeah, they're coming across <laughs> there. They are run into by Willard's Brigade. Um, Barksdale's going to be uh, mortally wounded. And besides to the right of Barksdale, or excuse me, Willard's Brigade, 1st Minnesota is going to come in and hit Cadmus, Cadmus Wilcox's Brigade of Alabamians. Um, to their left is the Florida's uh, Floridian Brigade under David Lang. And then you have Ambrose Wright. And he's the one that gets... Not quite to it, but close to the U.S. Regulars Monument. And if you if you walk west from that monument, down to the wall, across the wall, there's a little pa- plaque out there for Ambrose Wright's brigade. And you mentioned it earlier, uh, Roseanne. That's the 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 commander that says, "I got to the line. The whole infernal Yankee army was up there. I didn't have a support." And uh, so they yeah. get there, and the the Floridians have been knocked back. And only one regiment of uh, uh, Carnet Posey's brigade, who's supposed to be on his left, moves up because they're entangled around the Bliss Farm. Um, and so he doesn't have that support on his left. I think he gives he's, he's unfair criticism towards the Floridians. They're up there. They just, they're getting knocked back by all these Union forces that yeah. are sent into the area. So, uh, But on the left, he doesn't have very much support. And... So everything sort of peters out along that portion of AP Hills line in, in, around the Bliss Farm area, let's say, and north of that. And then everything goes over to Lower Culp's Hill, and that's where Allegheny Johnson's division of Richard Yule's Corps is going to attack. And you had that big fight over there, and it turns dark. It's a wooded hill. Any lamb, ambient light would have been blocked out by the uh, trees because it's no daylight savings time. It gets darker earlier. Right. Um, famously, George Sears Green, his brigade is at the top, about 1,400 men. They spend all day building breastworks from one end of the hill to the other end of the hill. In the middle, there's this traverse uh, where you have the 137th New York David Ireland. And all the troops have been pulled off Culp's Hill because they're responding to the line of sickles being broke. That leaves the 1,400 men under George Sears Green up there. And he's being ta- attacked by approximately 4,000 Confederates. But it's dark. They're fighting behind breastworks. The Confederates are fighting uphill, very rocky terrain. And I don't, that helps the Union Army hold on to Upper Culp's Hill. Now, Lower Culp's Hill, the Confederates are going to occupy those breastworks that the Union Army had built all day and formerly occupied at the end of the day. But the Upper Hill, Union Army is going to hold on to. And then everything jumps over to... East Cemetery Hill, where you have Louisiana Tigers and North Carolinians attacking East Cemetery Hill. Louisiana men are going to get up to the gun line. They're going to break through the gun line a little bit. It's going to be hand-to-hand fighting up there. By hand-to-hand, the Union gunners up there, the artillery men, are using the instruments from their gun. The staff, the rammer, that stuff. They're using that as uh, weapons, fighting off these these um, Confederates. Now, because the attack on the other end of the field, the other side of the field, rolling up the line peters out, the northern portion of Hancock's line, up where Alexander Hayes is, they're not facing anybody right now. So he's able to send a brigade, Carroll's brigade of Ohio troops, over to East Cemetery Hill to help out the Union line over there and knock these men from Louisiana and North Carolina back. So that, because the northern portion of the line of on Cemetery Ridge is now not threatened by Confederates because they're attacking it stopped, they're able to release some of those troops to move over to the other end of the line where their line is being attacked. And that's called using your internal lines. A huge advantage for the Union Army here. Um, and at the end of the night, Unions are, are able to preserve East Cemetery Hill along with Upper Culp's Hill. And then 
that story flows into July 3rd, which will be another episode. Right, right. Um, okay. Is that too much? No, no, no. That's, that's exactly where I wanted <laughs> to go. I'm just talking. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, now, and, and for those of you who are all new to addressing Gettysburg again, uh, we have a huge library of uh, episodes. <laughs> library. Just I'm a librarian. A former I librarian. Am a librarian. Are you? Oh, wow. Well, let's have another episode Yeah, here. let's just talk about yeah, how you guys I used to be a librarian. I say that because I got fired from my last library. <laughs> what, did you know the Dewey Decimal System or what? <laughs> library of Congress. Uh, See there? Yeah, everybody says Nirvana. Dewey. There's another classification. And I was a cataloger, too. Oh, I love cataloging. Oh, it's the best. Jesus. This is the most boring conversation <laughs> I've ever oh, heard about. Where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Could you talk about something drier than that? Oh, libraries Holy. are the best. <laughs> librarians? Librarians rock. Librarians. <laughs> yeah. Everybody now, loves books. So we have a, a huge library of uh, episodes and uh, many of those uh, things. Culp's Hill, we've done a few on. Uh, I don't think we, we haven't done an East Cemetery Hill one yet, which I want to do this year. We did a get out of the car, though. We did do a get out of the car tour uh, of East Cemetery Hill and, uh, you know, all these things. So, you know, there's a lot for you to go and listen to. So I encourage you to subscribe and, uh, and listen uh, to all these other episodes. Okay, so Roseanne. Uh, back in the town, finish out Je- July 2nd for us in town. Okay, well, you mentioned Breastworks on Culp's Hill. Well, there are Breastworks in town, too. Mm-hmm. Um, no- most notably um, along the cross streets, down at Breckenridge, um, across from the Jacobs house. So, you know, it's looking like a, a war zone there. One of the things, though, that the civilians are, they, they're hearing the battle going on, but they're not knowing what's going on. They don't know who is holding the advantage. The Confederates are not giving up any information. They're not really telling them um, who has the advantage. Maybe one or two people have the inside information, like Catherine right. Foster did say they were. They were very talkative with her, but um, many of the other civilians were saying, we had no idea, you know, by the end of the day, uh, who the advantage lied with or laid with whichever well, it was the proper lane? pronunciation lane with uh, who had know. it they don't know we don't use the word lane but we <laughs> well, should they, they were uh, they were about as in the dark um, as you could be you know both literally in the cellar and in terms of what is going on um, but you know nonetheless they're out there doing what they can do um, for the wounded um, you know again food is, is becoming an issue um, for them um, and and you know Harriet Bailey, someone that that I didn't mention, but she was outside of town. We've been talking about people in town, but you know there were farms outside of town as well. And uh, her farm was uh, north of town, along Table Rock Road. And on the second day, she is out and she's talking about um, what she sees from her house. She says, as far as I could see, they were men living and dead and horses and guns and cannons and confusion everywhere. And uh, she was already prepared. She was one of the few that, you know, um, I call it the go bag. You know, she already had her bag of supplies ready in case she had to go. And so she takes that bag with her and she goes out to begin ministering to the soldiers that she sees lying in the broiling sun, as she calls it. Many of them were out there um, for 24 hours, no food, no water, and yet um, there were Confederates walking around, you know. And she gets angry with them. She says, how can you let these men lie here in this sun? You ought to do something about this. She actually shamed them uh-huh. into um, providing water. And, uh, well, of course, they're giving excuses. First, oh, there's no water around here, lady. And <laughs> an officer here, is, and he says, I, I don't care. You go find water. You get something to help these men. You know, so many of them um, were, were, were doing as much as they were able to do, but yet the situation was so overwhelming that I don't think any of them felt that they were doing anything beyond the most minuscule amount that could right. be done. I mean, Sally Myers talks about that, you know, on, on the second day when she goes into St. Francis Xavier Church and she meets with, you know, the first soldier she sees is Alexander Stewart. And, you know, what can I do for you? Well, nothing. I'm dying. And then she goes outside. She sits on the steps and she starts crying. I mean, how can you not feel overwhelmed in a situation sure. like that you want to do something to aid you want to do something to help but yet you don't feel that whatever you're going to do is yeah. going to make any difference there's nothing worse than being thrust into a situation involuntarily and not being equipped to handle it mm-hmm. not only like personally but i mean like do the job you know these aren't medical professionals these are regular people who are now tasked with the job of being a nurse yeah, but nonetheless, they you know they, they did rise to the occasion. Sure, but I mean, I'm, I'm saying that it, that must weigh on you mm-hmm. because you want to help. You see someone suffering, you yep. want to help them, but you don't know what mm-hmm. to do. 
So, you know, and that's got to be very frustrating and it's got to make you feel terrible. I feel bad for them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so the wounded, you know, obviously, you know, there, there must be an influx. Well, once the fighting starts, there must be a good influx of uh, some wound. Well, I guess there wouldn't be for Longstreet's men or the Union men down on this end. But um, when uh, East Cemetery Hill is attacked, they're probably and Culp's Hill, they're probably getting a lot of uh, Confederate wounded coming in, right? I don't know. I don't know if they were brought in to town from that location. Um, oh, okay. I know that you know the hospitals, the churches, the public buildings that had the wounded in them were most likely from the the first day. Yeah. Um, and anything, anyone that's being brought so they're in from still the field, dealing with I'm, first day. I'm not. I am not an expert enough to know okay. what happened to those wounded. I mean, I got to say, though, I, last night um, the roundtable had a, a talk with Ron Kirkwood talking about the Spangler farm and all the wounded that were there. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm pretty certain that probably played a, a, a major part. On a side note, can can you get wounded. the roundtable to change their night? <laughs> For two reasons. Yes, I know Veronica was there. Veronica last night. <laughs> doesn't do addressing yeah, Gettysburg today. She was moonlighting last yes. night. Yes, <laughs> and also I'd like to go to some of these things. I know. But what round you know. table is it? Civil War uh, Gettysburg. Civil War Gettysburg round table. Round table. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. You know, let, mm. I, I would think that the there's so many wounded that the town just couldn't handle that many. So sure. they're going to farms and stuff where they can have access to water and space. Yeah. In these big barns, like there's a the, uh, another Spangler farm back over there um northeast i think of of cemetery hill east cemetery hill so they're using i think they would more likely use big farm areas because of space because there's so many wounded jacob whitecourt farm where tilly was for example i I think that that's probably what i've read i would imagine that that's where well that makes sense for the Union troops because it's right behind their lines. Yeah, the town's as far not, as the Confederates. yeah, but the Confederates. Yeah. I mean, if you're attacking East Cemetery Hill, I would imagine you know, town is directly behind but you. But I got to tell you though, a lot of them were lying there in the fields, yeah, for days, yeah, and they didn't always, you know, just pick up. Oh, he's wounded. Let's grab him. Right. It you gets know, hard when they're so unit. close to the line. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to be shot. I mean, not everybody's know. that friendly. Yeah. The, uh, well, and then if everybody grabs, you know, if you got one or two guys carrying a, a severely wounded guy off, if everybody went and did that, there'd be nobody to fight. You know, you couldn't. You can't just go running around grabbing <laughs> wounded guys and taking it back and pairing up with your buddy to carry him back or something. You got to stay and fight. You got to keep going. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's yeah. You're right. Um, all right, so Lewis, uh, why don't you uh, uh, set up set the stage for July third? How do how do things end on July second? I think there's a fellow named George Meade who holds a, a council of war, doesn't he? He does, and he um, there's two things: there's Confederate and uh, Union. So George Meade does hold a council of war, and he he, he puts forth three questions: um, stay and fight. And by fighting, I mean attack or stay on the defense, two separate questions, or get out of here, retreat to another position. And the the consensus is let's stay and wait and see what the Confederates do. And the big difference, this is a huge difference between the armies at this point. After the second day, the Union Army can afford to sit there. Yeah. yeah. Because their big supply base is back at Westminster. They can resupply. Ammunition doesn't grow on trees for the Confederates. Mm -hmm. So when the Confederates wake up on the 3rd, Lee, you know, overnight, Lee has the same questions. He's asking himself probably, what are we going to do? Whatever we're going to do, the next day we're going to have to do something different because we just can't stay here. They're having to go further afield for food and such. But the, 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 uh, the Confederate option I was mentioning was there's supposed to be another attack. And that attack is from the northwest towards Cemetery Hill. And that's Robert Rhodes' division, who was a big part of the fighting on the first day. And he has two lines uh, along Long long Lane facing the northwest slope of Cemetery Hill. And I believe Ramsier is in front, in control of the three brigades in front. And he's the one, I think, that makes the decision and relays it back to Rhodes. Like, he's got, like... I don't know how many cannons staring at him, and he can see this. It's across open ground. There's not the structures blocking the view that there are today. Right. And he says, I can't send my men up into that. It's yeah. wide open. We got all these cannon 
staring at us with no artillery support behind you, basically. Yeah. And so they declined to, to attack. And that's supposed to be about 9 o'clock. So that wraps up what the Confederates are doing on that day. Um, but that's what the Union Army does with the Council of War. Do we want to fight? And if so, how do we want to fight? Offensively or defensively? And the third option is retreat out of here. And contrary to what Dan Sickles says, they're going to stay and fight. And by that, I mean he goes back to D.C. by July 5th. He's talking to the president. Bashing Meade. I moved out, made them attack us. Meade never wanted to fight here. Yeah. Thank God I saved America, man. <laughs> yeah. Damn Sickles. I deserve a golden leg. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll give you the Medal of Honor. All right, I'll take that. <laughs> All right. Well, so then uh, it sounds like uh, we with the sage the stage is set for tomorrow, July third, eighteen sixty three, and twenty twenty three, and uh, that's uh, that's about it here. Of course, Lewis is a licensed battlefield guide. Roseanne is a licensed town guide. Uh, I recommend you uh, take a tour with both of them if you get a chance. And uh, if you want to do that, the uh, best easiest way to do it is to send an email to Dave at Addressing Gettysburg. No longer Matt at Addressing Gettysburg because I can't keep up with the emails. I thought you just changed your name. I might just, I might eventually do that. Yeah, yeah. That's a better story. Yeah, (laughs) that's for another podcast. (laughs) Uh, No, but yeah, so uh, send it to Dave, D-A-V-E at AddressingGettysburg.com. Tell him that you want to be put in touch with whoever and he'll do that and then you can arrange uh, your own tours accordingly and uh, that's about it Lewis thank you very much for uh, coming on the show Roseanne thank me. you again always fun do we have you again on uh, whenever we do in July 3rd I don't even know who's scheduled I don't know okay I don't know uh, that's the beauty of having Dave Dave does <laughs> you just show up and I other just show up and you. then I go oh you're on okay <laughs> well I, you know, I was at the round table last night and I didn't check my mail until I came home at uh-huh. 11 o'clock it's like can you can you do this? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, last minute, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming on, guys. And thank you all for listening. Like I said, go check all the rest of our episodes out if you're new to it. And uh, if uh, you're not new to it, thank you for your continued support. Don't forget to uh, spay and neuter your pets. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and become a patron. Patreon.com slash address in Gettysburg. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. All righty. Our hearts of stout have got a stain for food to spill from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and Glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down there, and pay the reckoning on the mail. No man for that shall go to jail for Gary Owen and Glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down there, and pay the reckoning on the mail. No man for that shall go to jail for Gary